Okay, we're going to try a little different scheme. Can y'all hear me all right? Yes. Are them babies on? Because I can't tell. Yeah, okay, right. they're on. Yeah. We're going to turn this off and keep this on and see if that takes out some of the Stanley cracking tonight. By the way, uh, one of the great themes that we find in the Bible is perseverance. And on that last song, we may have stumbled, we may have fallen, but we persevered. Amen. And God do it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take our Bibles tonight and open them to the book of Nehemiah chapter 9, and we're going to be in verse 6 tonight. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, we are looking tonight at the Creator makes us complete. And we're going to be talking about the ramifications that has for our lives personally and individually and our ministry as a church. How important is it that number one, we are created, and number two, this Creator is the only one who can complete us. Let's take a look here. Nehemiah chapter 9, this is in the middle of this huge prayer that the Israelites are praying as they are turning back to God. And we read them speak this to him in verse 6. They say, you alone are the Lord. You created the heavens, the highest heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, you give life to all of them, and the heavenly host worships you. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before you tonight, we are thankful that you tell us where we are from, how we were made, and most importantly, why we are made. And God, tonight, I just pray that all of us would come with hearts and minds that are open to hear the immense realities of this, that we would both glorify you for being the awesome creator that has created all things, including our lives, and how central it is to being created by you that we exist in all that we do to glorify you. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight to have a renewed mind that we might look at our lives and quit playing with trinkets and things in this world that are destined to perish, and that we would invest our lives completely and totally in you, that we might live in your joy to the glory of your name. Guide us now, we pray. Help me to proclaim this, for you know I can do nothing without you, and help us all, Lord, to hear you, for you know that we cannot hear without you. So just do that work in us all that only you can, we pray, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of a scientist that once challenged God to a incredible thing. He said that he believed he could create a better human than God could create. And God said, I'll tell you what, I'll take you up on that challenge. And the scientist came, and he sat down, and God came, and he sat down, and God reached down in the dirt and began to form something, and he looked over, and the scientist was picking up dirt, and God said, oh, no, no, you make your own dirt. <laughs> yes, sir. We often forget, don't we, that everything we made has been made by God. We can do nothing without him. Nothing comes from nothing, and by that fact, we see all things made around us, and we know that at somewhere, at some point in time, there had to be a first original cause to it all. That first original cause is a person, and that person is named God. He is the creator of all things, and of course, the philosophical mind the deep teenage mind will often say, well, if everything exists from something and all things were made by something before, then who made God? Oh, that sounds so deep, man. <laughs> like the Christian faith is now obliterated by that question, right? It is hard for us to wrap our minds around the reality that there is a being that exists without time. That there is a being that is so powerful he can speak, and creation is made. That there is one who has no beginning and will have no end. It's hard for us to get our minds around that type of being, but that is exactly the type of being that we see in our God. And as our scripture declares, he alone is Lord. He alone is Lord. He has created all things. He is Lord 
over all things. There is nothing outside of his power. There is nothing that he is not in total control of. He is wholly separate from all that is created, all that we see, all that is known in the universe. He is indeed God alone. He is Lord alone. He is ruler. He is sovereign. He is king of all creation and every creature in it. From the highest heaven, our Bible says, and all the hosts contained therein to the surface of the earth and in the sea and in the air, every animal, every fish, every bird, every angel created by him. And out of all that creation, he made one in his likeness that could relate to him. And that one is man. As we are created by him, he is Lord of us. We are ruled by him. That is the fundamental building block of our faith. It begins by confessing that there is one God and that one God has created all that is. There can be no turning to God unless that truth is warmly embraced in our hearts and souls. When the early church met in a place called Nicaea, they all come together and as we all do any time, Churches meet together. There's got to be debates, and everybody has an opinion, and this, that, and the other. But thankfully, by the grace of God, this confession come forth, and this confession reads right out of the pages of our scripture tonight. The very first thing that is said, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. That's who we believe in. And as we see in this massive prayer from the book of Nehemiah, the Jews embrace that reality as their hearts turn back to God. And we meet with God tonight in his word that we too might look upon him, that we might glorify him and honor him as the creator that makes us complete. It's my heart's desire that we would come back to the heart of what it means that God has created everything, even us, for his glory. And that as we admire him for it, that we would be ready, willing, and able to have our hearts to be searched by him in such a way that we come into the fullness of what that means for our lives individually and for our lives as a, as a ministry. Now, I've got to warn you. The first part of this sermon is going to be a lot of amen. It's going to be a lot. Yes, God is creator. He is awesome. He is wonderful. He is amazing. He is holy. The second part, probably not so many amens. Because it gets a little convicting there when we realize that if we have been made by him for his glory, then we need not settle for anything less than him or try to trivialize him on this world and in this ministry. So let's begin. And let's look first tonight at the wonderful truth that he is the glorious creator. As we hear the heart of the Jews send up this prayer like incense before God saying, you created the heavens, the highest heavens and all of their hosts, the earth and all that is on it and the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host worships you. My brothers and sisters, we cannot go where, know where we are going if we do not know where we have come from. And thank God the answer of the Bible is very clear to us as to where we come from, how we got here, and the purpose of us being here. You don't get past one page in the Bible. You don't get past the first sentence in the Bible before God tells you, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It is he that formed this huge celestial ball we call earth. It is he that made the light in the sky that we call the sun, the light at night that we call the moon. It is he that has made all things in heaven and on earth. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl made by him, every angel in heaven made by him, every demon in hell made by him. All things have been made by him. And the scripture says here that the highest heavens with all of their hosts worship him. He is awesome for making all things and he is awesome for how he has made all things. Check this out from Psalm 33. 
The Bible says, let the whole earth tremble before the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came into being. He commanded and it came into existence. Wow. That sort of puts life in perspective, doesn't it? Can God, can God deal with this problem that I'm going through? Well, he spoke Mars into existence, so I'm going to say it. Amen. Amen. Believe me, believe he's got this. Can you imagine the raw power that is God's, that he can speak in stars are born, that he can command in solar systems and planets are formed. I mean, let's just be honest about it, folks. Our voices can barely train our dogs to do what we want them to do, but he speaks, and the whole universe, the whole expanse of it is created. So we see here the immense power of God, and we also see that he has made all things for his glory. Listen to this from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. And they certainly do that, don't you? You know, I heard a preacher say something fantastic this past week. He said that nobody goes to see the Grand Canyon for self-esteem. When you look at the Grand Canyon, you lose yourself, right? You are lost in the immense wonder of it all. And you just sit and marvel at this great God that has created this whole planet and all of its greatness and majesty and wonder. God has made it all for that. That's what the Bible says. Day after day, night after night, they declare the glory of God. It's amazing. We, we were not made for mirrors. We were not made for selfies. We were, we were made to look at what God has made and to see him and to glorify him, and to take all of our joy, happiness, and fullness from him. This God is awesome. In fact, there is so much knowledge of God revealed in creation that while that knowledge is not saving, it is sufficient to condemn us. What I mean by that is nobody, nobody will be able to stand before God and say, you didn't give me enough evidence because we see it constantly. That's what, that's what Paul was explaining in Romans when he said that man has willingly and sinfully by their unrighteousness suppressed knowledge of the truth since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. And how has he done that? From the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, been understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. You know, sometimes it, it runs through our minds. Maybe you've thought about it. Maybe you hear other people say about it. You know, what, to, what happens to... To the man, the woman, the boy or girl that has never heard about Jesus, do they go to hell when they die? What, what, if they were, what if they were good people? They lived good lives and they just didn't know about God. Do they still go to hell? And, and folks, there's people, there's people like that left in the globe. They have never heard the name of Jesus. They're still there. What happens to them? What happens to the person that lived a good life and was moral in all that they did when they stand before God? Well, here's the first problem. That person doesn't exist. That's the first problem. <laughs> there is no one who does good. There is none righteous, says the Lord. Second of all, they did not pursue God. Paul says in Romans 1, they look at this creation, they know there's a God, and what do they do? They start creating things with their hands that they say created all of this. They take a piece of wood and they say this piece of wood made all of this. They take a piece of silver and they form it and they say this silver made all of this. They don't seek the God 
of creation. You go to hell not because you didn't hear about Jesus. You go to hell because you are a sinner condemned. All of us are born that way. I mean, if that's not true, and I can tell by the looks on some faces tonight, that may not be crossing over like it should. Let me, let me just put it this way. If everybody goes to heaven that never hears about Jesus, then shut up. <laughs> Don't tell them if they go to heaven without hearing the gospel. They don't. That's why it's imperative that we share the good news. That's why it's imperative that we say, yes, this God that you know is out there by the beauty of the night sky and the wonders that you see upon the horizon. Yes, this God exists and his name is Jesus Christ. He came and died that you could have life in him. And we are part of this. And the Bible says in Isaiah, everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. You were made for the glory of God. You certainly have been saved for the glory of God. You belong to him. We are created as creatures made in his image to relate to him and being saved by his blood that he shed for us on the cross. We become those called by his name, made for his glory. With the heavenly host, we live to worship you, O oh God. And this reality brings us to look secondly tonight at God being the creator who completes us. He doesn't just make us. He completes us. What I mean by this is that God in his creation of us and his power to create all things has made us so that we will find our completion in him. By knowing him, I know where I'm from, I know where I'm going, and I know what I need to be about, which is knowing this God and glorifying him. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's, it might be a little bit mind-blowing, but what we are seeing here is what Israel come to acknowledge, and that is that they, like everything else that has been created, have been made and saved to glorify Him. They tried the life of not doing that, and it landed them in Babylon as slaves for years. They tried to live with other gods. And it brought them complete and utter ruin. But when their hearts turn back to him, they are realizing he's made us and only he can complete us. We've been made and saved to glorify him. So how do we do that? I mean, we, we throw those words around a lot in church, don't we? That let's glorify God. Let's come together. Let's glorify the Lord. We are saved to glorify him. We are made to glorify him. So what is that and how do you do it? This means that we are taking all of our pleasure, all of our hope, all of our joy, all of our fullness in God and in God alone. We understand he has made us. We understand only he, the one that created us, can also complete us. Only he can do that. So we are just casting all of ourselves upon him. And the more we cast ourselves upon him, the more he is glorified. The more we show that we are dependent upon him, the more he is glorified. The more that we humble ourselves before him, the more that he is glorified. And the more we find our completion, not in this world or the things of it, but in the creator of it and the Christ of it. We realize that he is the only independent being to be found anywhere, and we are totally dependent upon him, and he loves to supply us with all that we need that our joy would be complete. So we need to pause a moment and take this in and remind ourselves that we must not seek to complete ourselves without it. Israel tried that. And I fear that we do as well. In the weirdest ways of the sand-twisted mind, we know that all things have been made, even we ourselves, for God's glory, and that he completes us, and yet what do we do? We try to complete ourselves. 
by gaining more of creation, by finding more happiness out of creation, but it doesn't work. It always fails. It always comes up empty because it's not meant to do that. Nothing will work but feasting upon him. You know, I wonder, I wonder sometimes if, if God ever scratches his head at us. Now, that's a metaphor. We know he doesn't. <laughs> but, you know, can you not just sort of put yourself in his place for a minute? You know, it's kind of like a little cartoon strip I read, and this is not biblical, so don't think it's biblical. But, you know, God is with an angel, and they're looking down on earth, and, and God says to the angel, what are they doing down there? And the angel says, oh, they're, they're making milk out of almonds. And God says, milk out of almonds? I gave them like eight animals to get milk from. Why are they getting milk out of almonds? <laughs> Consider this. God brings himself to us as the all-powerful, all-consuming, all-sufficient creator, savior, and sustainer of the world and of our soul. He is enough, right? He is completely enough. We don't need anything else. He is enough for our total happiness, enough for our blessing, enough for our praise, enough for our salvation. We need nothing beyond or above him. In him we find everything we need. And he saves our souls by his great power and blood and spirit and tells us all authority, all authority, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days to the end of the age. Okay, so let's get this straight. Jesus is Lord of all. And to him has been granted all authority in heaven and on earth. All rule is his. Nothing is outside of his rule. His rule is complete. That includes your life. He rules it. Even when you think you're ruling it, he still rules it. But you're just working and grieving his spirit as he tries to rule. So he comes forth and says, all authority is mine. There's nowhere you can go beyond me to get more authority, more power. Nothing like that. It's all found in me. And he tells us to go and take the knowledge of him to the nations that the nations might be glad through coming to Christ through the gospel. As we have been made glad, so he tells us to go and tell others of this awesome God who has created all things and made us specifically for the ends of his glory. And because this world is dark and fallen, there's going to be problems. It's going to be tough. We're going to, we're going to sense sometimes like we, we are so at our wits end that we cannot take another step. And it's right there that Jesus says, no, 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 I'm with you always. I'm, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm with you always to the end of the age. You know, and, and to the day you enter heaven, when you will be with me forever, I am with you. And I'm with you as the one who what, has all authority and has the ability to make the nations glad. That's our God. There is one single response that we should have to such a God. And that response is, wow. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> When we gather together as his people, our thoughts and our conversations should constantly be filled with the awe of knowledge of him and knowing that he has brought us to this point. Wow. I mean, the God who created these solar systems so far outside of ours, that God has saved us, that God. The God that rules every molecule in the entire universe, that God. He saved us. He's made us, and he's told us he'll never leave us or forsake us. You know, I'll never forget. <clears throat> I'll never forget the day I was speaking to our dear sister in the Lord, Susie Chris. And I've told you this before. You just will get used to it. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> and I'm saying it tonight because it is such a great, great testimony. And it's so 
the soul proves what we're seeing in the scripture. You know, okay, I'm, I'm at Susie's house the morning after Merle has passed away. And that is after heart surgeries, open heart surgery. It's just a bad time. It's a bad time. And you know Susie. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm at the hospital. Merle is literally laying there about to get his chest cut open and his heart operated on. Susie, how are you doing? I am blessed big time. <laughs> And I've got to tell you, even I'm like, Susie, his kids are right here, you know. <laughs> and I, I think it dawned on her because that morning when I'm, when I'm talking with her, she says, you know, I, I don't know if people always take me right when I say I'm blessed. And I'm like, yes, yeah, Susie, I can see how that would happen. <laughs> you know. And here's what she says. She, she looks out her window. Now, remember, this is the same day, okay? This is the, the morning of the day that she ends up with a brain hemorrhage and ends up in the hospital, and that eventually leads to her passing away and going to glory. That, this is that very morning. And Susie looks outside the window, and she says, here's the thing, preacher. She said, when I look outside and I see all that God has made, and I think that the God who has made all of this has a per. And she took her finger. I never. She took her finger like this. That this God has a personal interest in me. I can do none other than to say, I am blessed. Amen. I am blessed. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That that's the heart that should beat in us all. Now we we live in. In hill country around here. <laughs> Some of y'all live out in the hills. When we see these hills, we should look and say, man, the God that made all of this died for me. Yeah. The, the God who put this sunset in the sky today, he, he died for me. He takes a personal interest in me. And like Susan, we should walk away saying, wow, well, I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. Now, I want us to note here that this being the case, we should settle. We should never settle for anything less than him. Don't ever settle for anything less than him. Why is it that since we have such a great and mighty God and an amazing commission to make him known, why do we, his people, ever settle for less? Let, let me read to you something that C.S. Lewis wrote one time. He said, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. He says, we are half-hearted creatures, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go and make mud pies in the slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. That's right. That's right. We settle for so little when infinite rewards are put before us by God. We are amused by trinkets from this world when Christ calls us to a banquet feast in him. We love and crave and scratch and claw to get more of this creation that is going to burn off in the end when Christ says he has an eternity for us where nothing we do for him ever perishes how we need to check ourselves to see if we are living a life of the glory of this God who has created us. And we need to make sure we don't bring a mindset into this ministry that isn't satisfied with him. Please, let's all make sure we don't bring a mindset into this ministry that thinks Jesus isn't enough. So let's check ourselves in this. Let's be honest with our own hearts. Do you ever find yourself doing that? Do you, do you ever find yourself huddled up in some room with other believers when the Bible is being taught 
the Bible's being proclaimed, and you're out doing some menial tasks, even here, when the Bible is being taught, and friend, I want you to know, listen, listen to me plainly and clearly on this, all of your ideas of God are utterly useless and worthless and futile and like manure unless they come from here. Amen. This is where God reveals himself to us. When this book is taught, when this book is proclaimed, this is God making himself known. Why? Why would we run around doing menial things that have no bearing in eternity whatsoever when Christ is revealing himself. Let me ask you this. Would, would you do that? Would you, would you be found doing that if, I don't know, Franklin Brown was preaching? Would you dare be running around in rooms doing stuff? And Would you dare do that? Or would you be right, oh, Franklin Graham's here. Friend, I, I want to tell you, somebody greater than Franklin Graham is here. Yeah. That that's not me. <laughs> Amen. It's not me. It's Christ. I mean, are, are we going to be found roaming around, getting little trinkets together? If the Ball Brothers are here, friend, I tell you, somebody greater than the Ball Brothers is here. Yeah. <clears throat> Check yourself. Because I want you to see if that is in your heart. If it is in you to think, I don't need to hear this. I don't want to hear this. I need to go be about something busy, but I want to do it in the confines of the church so I feel religious about what I'm doing. You have to know that it's coming from a heart that is showing that you don't believe Jesus is sufficient. And do you see what we sometimes do, my brothers and sisters? When we aren't convinced that Jesus alone is all that is required for our complete joy and happiness and salvation, that his word is insufficient, that it begins to bleed directly into everything we do here. Here's what happens. Amen. You ready for the brute honesty of this? Yeah. When that happens, what we will begin to do is we will market Jesus to the world like respects market steak. Amen. Look at this picture of this beautiful steak. It is on sale this week. Won't you be so happy if you have our steaks? Of course, you go down and buy the steak. Maybe it's good. Maybe it's not. You eat it, you forget about it. Yeah. Because whatever got you there, when it leaves, you leave with it. So I want you to see it. I want us to take an inventory here that if we are selling Jesus, the creator who can complete us, if we are selling him with prizes and snacks and games and just, you know, I heard a, heard a church, they did this thing where uh, they gave away something incredible like this huge, humongous screen TV, if, if everybody came and invited somebody to church or something like that, whoever invited the most people got a big screen TV. I got something better for you. How about an eternal reward that will be with you in eternity long after that big screen TV has been thrown in the trash heap. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> uh, we, let us check ourselves because if we're not careful, here's what happens. Let's, let's just say you're throwing a, a birthday party for your kid, your nephew, a niece, whoever. And you say, we're going to have a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. Everybody knows Chuck E. Cheese, right? Yeah. That's not just, a, okay. Yeah. want to make sure I wasn't, because y'all sit down to be like, who's Chuck? What? <laughs> So we're going to have a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese. And you, you tell your kid, you, you tell your son, your daughter, your niece, nephew, whoever. You say, listen, go out and invite all of your friends. Tell them to come in. All the games will be paid for. All the pizza will be paid for. Bring them in. And you have that birthday party and 50 kids show. And it's awesome. It's great, right? I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. But what if you said... 
we're going to have a birthday party here at the house. Mm -hmm. Invite your friends and 5K. Did the 50 come for your kid? Like the five? If they're there, they're there for your kid. Yeah. It's not about building the best human mousetrap we can make. Give me one true convert, one true disciple, and you can have the hundred that come with thoughtless applications for Christ. We want to make sure that we are about the Son. And the way we keep our hearts right with that is by understanding He is the only one that's created us. He is the only one that saved us. He is the only one that can complete us. So the question is, do you believe that? Will you have the boldness to live that this year? When you look at the night sky, will you look and say yes to God? When you look to the hills, will you say yes? When you look to the cross, well, you say, yes, Lord, you've created me, you died for me, you and you alone complete me. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are so easily twisted and convoluted and confused. Sometimes even with the greatest of sincerity, Within us, we go totally amiss from what you have done and who you are. So I just pray tonight for my heart and for the heart of every brother and sister of mine here tonight. God, hold us fast on this reality that you have made us and you alone can complete us, that you alone have our joy, that you alone have our happiness. Help us, God, to ditch every temptation that tries to trick us and deceive us into believing it will be found anywhere else but you. Help us to rest all we are in you, O oh God. And may tonight you work upon every heart here, beginning with mine, your perfect will. And if there is one more that is needing tonight, called of you tonight to put their faith in you, God, grant them every grace to do so and help them to come down this aisle to meet me and proclaim this to the congregation that we all might rejoice in you. Bless the heart that repents tonight. Bless the heart that seeks you. We love you and we praise you, our great creator God who completes us. In Jesus' name, amen.